I'll come clean with you all. I've never beaten an Amnesia game. I've never been a big fan of the first-person run-and-hide brand of horror game, where the focus is crouching behind boxes and barricading doors. As a one-off level in an otherwise more mechanically complex horror game, this sort of scenario is fine, but as the focus of a five to six hour game, it usually gets pretty repetitive for me. But after doing some research into the new Amnesia the Bunker, and seeing a gun in a safe room with a map, I was like, well, good enough for me. Looks like there's more going on in this one. After parrying my way through the action horror of RE4 Remake earlier this year, I've been wanting to play a new horror game with a real emphasis on survival and dread, but still with plenty of mechanical depth. And Bunker ended up being exactly what I was looking for. World War I, and the French are stuck in the trenches. You play a French soldier who wakes up in a bunker. All hell has broken loose inside though, the way out has been blocked, and you're not alone in these tunnels. You have to venture deep into the bunker to find the means to blow open the way out, going back and forth between a central hub and a series of areas that branch off from it. So yeah, you're being chased around these tunnels by a big spooky monster that can basically one-hit kill you if it grabs you, and the claustrophobic nature of the environment, the design of the monster itself, the horrible sounds it makes. Second guessing if it's near you or you're just hearing the sound of World War I happening above you. all makes for a spooky time, but it's how the game mechanically works that really ups the tension. You have to save your game manually at a lantern, and if you get grabs, you'll respawn there. There's no penalty for saving, you don't need to use an item or something, so what's stopping you from saving after making any little bit of progress, you ask? Well, there's only one save point, and it's in the central hub, so making the trip back when you're deep in the bunker is always a bit of a journey. You'll want to risk staying out to maximize what you can get done every trip but not just to be efficient, but because the game has a ticking time bomb in the form of a generator located in your safe room. This thing keeps the lights on in the bunker and has to be refilled with petrol to keep it active. So you have a limited amount of time to be out doing your thing before the lights go out and you have to go back and refill it. If the lights go out, not only will that make seeing what you're doing pretty tricky, but you'll be easier prey for the monster who seems to become bolder in the dark. Your wind-up torch is also pretty loud, so the more light you can get without it, the better. In fact, everything you do is pretty loud in this game. A big part of this title is spent figuring out how to blow doors open while knowing a place to hide after you've signaled your exact location to the monster. The generator is a great idea because it means you can't play it super safe. You have to take risks when out exploring the bunker to make the most of the light you have. You have limited inventory, so the amount of heals, defensive items, and other tools you can take with you has to be carefully thought out. And even your map can only be looked at at home base. So it's good to think out your route as well before leaving, since you're going to be dealing with some pretty similar looking dark hallways. You could cheat, I guess, and take a photo with your phone. What's the fun in that? Just read the Wikipedia page, mate. It'll tell you how the game ends. Saving using the storage box or filling up the generator aren't the only reasons you might want to head back to the safe room, since nearby there's a locker room with a lot of handy resources, the codes for which are usually on dog tags found deep in the bunker. When you find one of these codes, you'll have to ask yourself a question. Is it worth returning to the hub for those now accessible items that could be crucial for surviving during your current objective, or should you only cash in the reward once you've done everything you need to do down wherever you are? Anyway, it all makes for quite a stressful game. You know it's effective at what it's doing when I'm just under an hour in and thinking, why do I do this to myself? Why have I just paid money to put myself through this? I like to psych myself up a little when leaving the save room by doing a little grind on this railing, a little pow slide out, you know? Just to let them know I'm in business and... <laughs> Okay, okay, no messing around, I get it. The game allows for multiple solutions to various problems, usually in regards to the aforementioned blowing up of doors, so there's room for experimentation. This doesn't turn the game really into some open-ended immersive sim game, or, or sorry, was game, an Overblood 2-like. You know, not every bit of experimentation yielded results for me. Come on, Flare, ignite the Molotov to ignite the explosive barrel. Hmm. The monster's a dick, I'm dumb, 
and we in the bunkalo. The best part of the way your supplies interact with the world isn't that it creates some open playhouse with loads of ways to solve a problem, even though the few different ways you can solve problems is nice, but that everything you collect has dual functionality, making the choice of when and how to use everything more challenging. You can use fuel to top up the generator or use it to create molotovs. You can fire a bullet to defend yourself against the monster or to crack open locks or shoot explosive barrels. You can find the dynamite to escape the bunker or you can hit the escape key to quit the game. For real though, the bunker is just pure survival horror decision making and it's great. Even trying to tank damage and roll past hazards will backfire with your character bleeding and attracting unwanted attention. All of this said, this game still leans more towards the run and hide style of horror game, more so than say a classic Resident Evil. It doesn't have large arsenals or multiple boss fights. Your gun here is more a problem solver and defensive tool, and less so a way to clear out the map of enemies. But that doesn't mean there aren't sparks of empowerment along the way that are all the more delicious in a game where you're starved for them. Since you can't kill the monster, shooting it most of the time feels like a waste of bullets, that you're not playing the game efficiently enough. But there will come a time when you've been down in a section of the bunker for a long period, a lot of progress is on the line, and then the monster shows up, only for something to snap within you and you put your foot down. No, I am not losing this progress to you. And in that moment, pulling out your gun, standing your ground, and getting the monster to go do one, feels great. I haven't played the Amnesia games, but I did play through the Penumbra games back in the day, and if there's one thing I found quite cool in those titles, it was the very physical way you interacted with doors and cabinets, having to manually pull them open and close them. That little bit of extra work you had to put in increased the tension, as it could lead you to fumbling around with a door in a way you could imagine happening for real if you were frantically trying to get it open. Basically doing the equivalent of opening it at the wrong angle and smacking your own face with it. And when rummaging around, it's kind of a pivotal element really. So this game about resource collection doesn't just become about running into a room, circling it while hitting a button that picks everything up and then leaving. Surprisingly, for an independently made five-hour horror game with amnesia in the title, the story is pretty straightforward. All of it is pieced together through memos and observing the environment, and it ends up not being very complicated when it's all said and done, but it's told in an entertaining, creepy way. It's satisfying to piece together, even though there aren't that many pieces, the environment is drawn compellingly enough to where I did want to read everything that I came across. There's a moment later on where the environment contorts to take you to a location I didn't expect it would, and when it does, no words are even needed to make one of the game's biggest revelations clear. It's not a groundbreaking story. If I told you the whole tale, it probably wouldn't sound all that impressive, but in the moment, it offers the game just the right amount of set dressing to make the exploration and survival compelling. It's not the most emotional adventure you'll be going on here. A lot of the tragedy has already happened and you're kind of rummaging around in the fallout of it. You won't say be beating the game and thinking, wow, what a moving journey I went on with Clemon. This game is what it says on the tin. It's a very good game about surviving in and escaping a bunker. And there's a monster there. This also isn't the kind of horror game that's gonna offer up some wild explosive edge of your seat finale for your efforts like a Resident Evil. The payoffs you'll get will be the ones you choose to take the time to discover and understand yourself as you explore, which is fine. I think the worst part of the story for me is just this gap in the hole you spend the whole game trying to get out of. Look, it doesn't look easy to climb through, but I think given this situation, I could pull it off. Even a dislocated shoulder would be worth it. Friction will need to patch in some more debris up there, I'd say. It's also worth noting that while there are visually horrifying scenes to discover here, they lean more towards guttural graphic shock value, which you think would be rather redundant, amidst the harrowing battlefields of World War I. The overall tension and atmosphere is done so well that the moments the game leans into detailed gore for that shock value come off kind of desperate by comparison. But this stuff does pop up, so keep that in mind if you're not into that kind of thing, and we're maybe expecting to come across some uncanny and twisted yet tasteful tableaus like in a classic Silent Hill or something. Also, the gothic imagery that was the highlight of what little I played of the original is also not a focus here, by the by. I think the way this game may fall short in some people's eyes is gonna come down to it being a humble production. You could imagine if this were a bigger production, there being a larger map with more varied enemies, 
rats with some, like, actual hair on them. It lacks those things, but it doesn't stop the game from succeeding at its intended goal. Something more AAA might have had more varied sound, a larger number of ambient tracks. Well, here things are kept very minimal, but the point is, again, the game has it where it counts. A soothing save room theme and monster sounds that remain unnerving throughout. The game world may not be that big and the threats not that varied, but the way that map is designed and the mechanics are implemented makes the game scary nonetheless. Yes, I think if you have any large familiarity with the genre, the bunker is not going to blow your mind. But save for that, it does so much else right that you should probably play it if you're starved for a new horror title. While the story and threats don't feel that new conceptually, the way it handles the save room and its generator twist is the spark it needed to make play feel fresh and involving. It's a dense game with surprises along the way that will keep you on your toes. Survival horror I still don't feel is in the best place. We seem flanked by blockbuster remakes and the odd bombastic Resident Evil game on one side, and jump scare hide and seek indies on the other. But the bunker represents a middle ground that it would be nice to see more of.